All right, it's one o'clock and let's get the ball rolling. So here you go. Mr. Vijay Babu, the floor is yours. And is he unmuted, Vijay? Vijay? And Yvonne, please unmute Mr. Kumar Virapin as well. Through the call, Mr. Fidel Bem, as well as uh, Mr. Arbe Garza. Please unmute the speakers. Okay, that's good. I can unmute now. Okay. Well, is Vijay on the call? I just kind of don't see him. Hi, Usha. Hi. No, Rama is <laughs> Is it my only opportunity? <laughs> All right, uh, Mr. Kumar Virapan, do you want to start? Because it's already one o'clock. And he unmute, Yvonne, please unmute him. I did, I don't see him anywhere. It, he's here, Mr. Kumar Virapan, it's still muted. You see him? K-U-M-A-R. I, I did. All right. Thank you so much. You know, um, my dear Sats parents, guest speakers, good afternoon uh, from San Antonio Tamil Sangam. I'm Kumar, uh, the current president of San Antonio Tamil Sangam. Hope you all are having a great weekend. It just started, right? Um, San Antonio Tamil Sangam Youth Club, which was formally launched last November 13th at our Deepavali event, you know, the goal of this youth club is to help enable high school students in our community um, to get into the right courses, uh, their next step in their career, uh, the, the courses in which they are passionate about, just providing them all the information that they are needed so that they won't confuse and things like that, you know. And not just high school students, help the parents also with all the informations, okay? Um, so Vijay Babu from San Antonio Tamil Sangam, he's the treasurer. He's, he's the one spearheading this, this effort from San Antonio Tamil Sangam. And this is the very first session from San Antonio Tamil Sangam's youth, youth club. Um, I thank, I take this opportunity to thank Usha Venkat for helping us in arranging this session. And I thank um, Mr. Fiddle and his colleagues uh, for taking time and uh, helping us and in providing all this information. With this, I call Vijay Babu to speak a few words. Vijay, over to you, please. Yes, um, again, Yvonne, Vijay, I'm, I'm actually chatting with you and trying to tell you to unmute some people. Yes, go ahead, Vijay. Yeah, I'm sorry, I got dropped off, but uh, I'm gonna speak in Tanglish. <laughs> I don't know if everybody knows Tanglish. So anyways, uh, First of all, uh, uh, I'm very uh, happy uh, in the youth wing uh, on the 25th year anniversary of the inaugurate of youth wing. And youth wing start in uh, three, four weeks. Uh, we are kickstarting this new session. I am so ex uh, excited and happy for our uh, community, first of all. And uh, with that, and I want to I wanna thank four individuals, right? You know, even though I am leading this effort, I was literally helped by four individuals. You know, uh, one is Valli. Uh, second one is Sashi, third one is Jenny, and fourth one is Banjo. You know, you all are me one day and again, inch by inch help to get here. Uh, in the program, and the youth wing, uh, whole uh, committee, you know. Uh, so I want to thank them to begin with. And uh, the next one is, uh, you know, uh, <clears throat> I want to thank Usha. <laughs> right? Usha, thank you so much for making this happen for us. You know, uh, the first event itself, it's a, it's a great event or the great session for us. You know, you brought a lot of great minds here. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm very sure they're going to give us a lot of information for our community. And I'm very happy and very excited to listen to them. Right. And I would like to thank them also. Um, with that, I want to pass it on to you, Usha, and let's keep this going. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Vijay. Thank you, Mr. Kumar Virapin. 
So uh, when Vali came to me about this opportunity to do a presentation, I jumped on it because, you know, I've been in education for more than 30 years. I serve as the director of technology for San Antonio College. And I came here as an international student, uh, attended some classes at St. Mary's University and then moved to SAC because I was completely um, switching my majors, I actually went from history to IT. So it was a big jump. And then once I completed uh, some courses at community college, um, then I was able to go and complete my master's in computer information systems. So uh, it was a big journey, but uh, a lot of people helped me along the way. But uh, when I first landed here in education, I, I found a lot of differences. Uh, differences, uh, just want to do a little disclaimer, nothing to say bad about Indian um, education system because uh, Indian education system gave my footing, right? I, I learned a lot through that system. And uh, then when I transitioned here, it was just a different system. If one is uh, not better than the other, but it's just different. So the first thing that came to my mind is, oh my God, you know, I'm now able to, I was empowered to choose different options, to try out different options. Not going to go into the details because Mr. Fidel Bem is more qualified to actually tell you all about what those options were. And um, I, I like the idea of being able to work while I go to school. So that was a big opportunity because it was experiential learning, right? You're able to apply your experience immediately. Then when I did graduate, all of those come together, my experience plus education. So everything was pulled in together. So it was a great experience and I, um, I loved my journey. So with that, not with, without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our key speakers here. Starting from Mr. Bem uh, Fidel, Fidel Bem, he's a director of advising at San Antonio College. Um, he has a lot of experience that spans over 20 years. He's worked with students in colleges throughout the United States, including Florida International University, Houston Community College, UT Austin. He's also an adjunct faculty member in world languages and has a professional background in academic advising, dual enrollment, international student services, residential life, student life, student records. Um, he enjoys uh, helping students and families navigating, and this is one of his uh, uh, interests, right? He's serving his what he's passionate about. Um, and so we're really proud to have him uh, to speak with us. Second, I want to introduce you, Mr. Conan Campos. He's a senior admissions counselor at Texas State University. Um, he works very closely with San Antonio College. Uh, his experience with the admission started over six years ago, and he's serving a lot of Alamo College's students through partnership with his university. So thank you, Mr. Conan Campos. Finally, um, I mean, I should say, right, they, they are the champions, uh, UTSA. We have to give them an applause. They won the big game championship game yesterday. And oh my God, it was uh, a really a big thing for San Antonio. Um, he's a transfer specialist from UTSA. And I'm, uh, he's a proud native of San Antonio. His journey started um, over 10 years ago. He has a bachelor's in communications and master's in public administration. Uh, he's really focused on creating an equitable environment for all the students, which is a big thing right now, inclusive, inclusivity and equitability. Um, he has extensive knowledge on career pathways, financial aid, college admissions, and UTSA is a big partner of Alamo Colleges. A lot of our students go straight there. Um, and I should say that he's also a new father to a baby boy, Romeo. He's very handsome, and I bet he's keeping him motivated. So thank you again for joining us with that. Mr. Ben Fidel, take it away. Thank you so much, Usha, and thank you to all of you for inviting us into this space to share a little bit about higher education in the United States. Uh, what I have to say before I launch into the presentation is Usha and I go way back. Uh, for many years, we would get together at the International Student uh, Banquets to congratulate our recent graduates, and we would share stories about what our experiences were like 
coming to the US and navigating this space and talking about the fear and the joys in those experiences. So it's wonderful to see there are new folks coming in who can learn from our experiences and probably avoid some of the pitfalls that we were privy to as we were coming into the United States. The second thing is, um, I wanna make sure that what I'm sharing is very brief because I'm so lucky to partner with Conan and Erbe and they're physically at our campus. And that's part of what this discussion is all about, navigating the spaces with the choices you have. So I'm gonna give a brief presentation, but for the most part, what I want this to be is you are the presenters who are just talking to us about what your needs are, what your fears are, what your questions are, and we'll do the best that we possibly can to try and enlighten you about what you can do at this point and how you can contact and communicate with those of us, not just here today, but who are members of the higher education um, world in order to make sure you have the best foot forward at all times for yourselves and for your families and friends. So as Usha and I were putting this together, the one thing that we realized that we have in common more than anything else is coming from a British background. So we're all members of um, the colonies. We're part of the Commonwealth. And even though we were worlds apart physically, the thing that united us was the educational experience because Usha was talking to me about, hey, Fidel, this is how you could prepare for it. This is what our families have to go through as they're going through the educational system in India. And I was thinking, huh, that's the exact th same thing that I went through in Barbados. So I can completely relate to the situation that many families are in. Uh, my parents were educated in Great Britain. And when it was time for me to be on my journey in the US, they said, I'm sorry, we can't help you. This is too overwhelming. This is nothing like what we've experienced, even though my dad's a lawyer and he's had a successful practice. So he's intelligent. It's not that he doesn't know what he's doing, but it was overwhelming for him. Even for our parents and students in the United States, we have professors at our colleges who look at us in fear saying, we don't know how to navigate these spaces, can you help us? So I can understand for someone who's come from another country what the experience can be like. So what I wanna to talk to you more than anything else is about just the myriad choices that you have and knowing that that in itself can be very overwhelming. So where I want to start is understanding that you have an overwhelming number of types and just sheer number of schools that are a part of higher education in the US. And then look briefly at the programs and degrees from a very uh, limited perspective. So one thing I like to educate all students on and their families is the fact that you don't just have options where you are right now, as in San Antonio or Bear County, or even the state of Texas. When a student first comes in to my department, I always ask them, and they'll look at me quizzically when I ask them this, do you plan on staying in this area? It's either San Antonio, or do you plan on staying in the state of Texas? Because where you determine to go influences how you take classes. So that's really important for the start of the conversation. And um, why I ask that is because you have a, a number of options. So I always like to talk to students about if you have the ability to do so, consider going to a community college first, then you can think about, am I wanting to go into a public university or a private university? Because the expectations that these types of schools have with their curricula can vary. So with the community college, we have two-year programs for the most part. San Antonio has, college has broken that mold very recently because we're gonna be the first community college in this area to offer a bachelor degree. But for all intents and purposes, um, community colleges offer two-year programs. And uh, this is something that Usha reminded me of. In our part of the world, we speak about polytechnics. And those usually have uh, workforce focused programs. And community colleges have the same things, but we also have academic tracks for students. So if you're coming into a community college and you um, talk about wanting to go into a particular degree, the first thing that we will ask you after we question you about 
where do you want to go to school? It's what career do you want to go into? Because sometimes the degree that you're asking to go into has nothing to do with the career that you are seeking. So if a person says to me, I want to go into business, I'll ask them, okay, so on your degree plan, it says you want to go into business management. So we'll unparcel that and I'll ask them, are you trying to go to work immediately after you finish this degree at our community college? Or do you want to transfer to university to get a bachelor's degree or maybe even a master's degree? And that helps determine the types of classes that students take. So classes can be very technical in nature where you're just focused on the career aspect of your curriculum, or they could be very academic in nature where students are looking at classes like English composition, geography, natural sciences like biology and chemistry. And then they also look at very focused classes in their career. If I use business as an example, we know that many business students have to take accounting and economics and business mathematics. So that's the strategy behind that. And then uh, the other aspect of it in terms of choices would be to what um, degree do you have to commit your time to the college? Uh, for many of us who come from different systems, uh, when you say, okay, I'm going to be a science major, when you declare that at your school, the school then determines for you, and this is outside of the US, what your schedule looks like. You come in at eight o'clock in the morning, you go to school straight through until maybe four, five in the afternoon. You'll have a one hour break sometime in there and you don't determine when or how you take the classes, the school hands you your schedule. In the US, it's significantly different from that. So many students can decide if they want to go to school full time, meaning they're taking about four classes or five classes each semester, or if they want to go to school part-time, anywhere from one class to three classes. And for many students who come from immigrant backgrounds, it's strange that you can decide, have so much choice in what your semester looks like. But we wanna make sure that students understand you can determine how many classes you take a semester, but dependent on the classes you take, it lets us know how long it will take to complete the degree at hand. The beauty about having the option of coming to a community college or a school like San Antonio College is that we partner with uh, schools such as Conan's and Herbes. So we have what normally we would call two plus two plans, or we call them transfer guides, where we have a formal agreement. And we have these in place with both UTSA and Texas State so that if you say, you want to be a business administration student and you start off at San Antonio College, you'll see that every single class that you take within the degree plan in those two years as a full-time student will translate directly into the equivalent four-year program at either UTSA or at Texas State. And there are a number of other schools that are part of these agreements. So as long as you're following the plan that's in place in the agreement with these schools, they will accept all of the classes into their plan. So when we look at how students transition, when you come into the community college, you can complete your associate's degree, which is about 60 hours. Then you transfer to the university and you'll complete another 60 hours to earn the bachelor's degree. Uh, the next thing that I talk about is credit hours. That can be very confusing as well. We have what are known as semester credit hours. What that basically translates to would be the number of classroom hours by week. And I put classroom in air quotes because in this day and age, especially emerging from the pandemic, more and more students are choosing to take classes virtually whether it's through Zoom or they just log into their computer uh, and they're able to do their work without having to directly interact with an instructor throughout the course of the class. So how this classroom hour breaks down, normally a semester lasts for 16 weeks or just around four months. And within those 16 weeks, the number of hours 
for which you're engaged in the class are broken down by week. So over the course of 16 weeks, if you're taking a three credit hour class, it means that you would meet with your instructor for three hours out of that week. Most classes uh, at a college are either broken down into two days or one day. So if you're meeting for a class two days a week over the full semester, it means you would have one hour and a half in the classroom each day uh, for the duration of that three hour class. And of course, if it's just meeting once a week, you would do all three hours in that day once a week for the full 16 weeks. And those classroom hours help contribute to what's known as the student's grade point average, or we say for short, their GPA. So the number of hours that the student takes the class along with the score that the student gets in the class. So if they have an A or B or C, we translate that A, B or C, that letter grade numerically, so that we take the, the score for the class, multiply it by the number of hours for which they've been in the class, and we come up with these quality points that we translate into their GPA. Um, so that's how we track student performance over the course of the degree that they're taking. So really important things to remember that students have a lot of choice. Uh, you can look at the school and we start off with community colleges, which are the two-year schools where you can do a technical or an academic program. Technical meaning you're focused on a specific career that you'll go into as soon as you finish that associate's degree. If it's academic for all intents and purposes, you're taking the first two years with the community college and then transferring to a university. At the university, you can complete a bachelor degree, which takes 120 semester hours or about 40 classes. And you can do half of it with a community college and the other half with the university. And then many universities also offer graduate programs. So after you finish the bachelor's degree, then you can continue on into what they term the master, which takes another two years or between 40 and 60 semester hours. And what some schools have started developing are these accelerated programs where you start off in a bachelor's program, but by the end of your degree, usually you'll take an additional year, you'll leave with not only your bachelor, but you'll also have your master degree in hand. So I know you probably have lots of questions. And since there are three of us here representing three rather distinct institutions, I want to open it up for you for questions and answers. And then we can elaborate a little bit more about what it looks like in the playground of higher education in all different types of schools so that uh, afterwards we can ev even send some additional information, resources for you through USHA at the end of the day. So I'll open it now for questions that you so, may have. Uh, Fidel, uh, right after everyone finishes speaking, then we have a Q&A section. Certainly. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so what I'll do, um, I'll turn it over to Conan. If there are particular things that you think, uh, coming from the perspective of someone who works with students at a four-year public, not too far away from us, up there in the wonderful land of San Marcos, I'd love for you to share. Yes, one of my biggest things that I enjoy sharing with students is to make connections. Um, it's those connections that you make with your peers, faculty, staff member, that really contribute to your success. Of course, grades and academics is what is going to get you your diploma. However, it's going to be those connections that will help you achieve that goal as well. So do not hesitate to share a pencil with your classmate. Uh, form study groups with your different peers, um, visit office hours with your professor, because it's going to be those connections that really help you along your way. Who knows, it could lead to um, a networking event where you now have an internship in your field, and that internship turns into a full-time job opportunity. I've had students tell me, oh, getting connected is pretty much the best thing that I've done, because it's gotten me all of those uh, internship opportunities. So if you're able to get connected, that's what I would say um, try and do. And that's what I would suggest uh, 
y'all to do as students. For family members as well, we have a parent and family program at Texas State where you can go ahead and get updates from the university on when bill payment is due, when do classes open up for students to register. That way you can go ahead and ask your student, hey, have you registered for your classes for next semester? And receive other periodic updates that the university deems important for parents to know. So we want you to be involved with your student success as well. And we provide you those means through our parent and family relations office. So once again, it's about building those connections with the university and as well as the peers that are there. So pretty much just build connections is my biggest piece of advice. Um, if we have any questions throughout, I can help with the admissions process and everything. So I look forward to talking with you all a little bit more. Thank you. Good afternoon and thank you everybody for allowing me to talk today. Uh, Mr. Fidel, thank you very much for inviting me. Um, you know, I'm a first generation American, so I know quite a bit about um, barriers that uh, might be ahead of certain people. Uh, English is my second language as well. But one of the things uh, about all of our universities is like, we want you there. We want you on campus. None of the, our universities, our public universities, Texas State, a and M, UTSA, we want you there. So we are inclusive. Like I said, I, I believe in equity and UTSA is amazing. Uh, you know, we're trying to be very diverse. We just hired a vice president just for diversity, you know, just to look at. Uh, one of the coolest things is uh, we have GeForce mentors, which is mentors that help students here. And when I'm doing interviews with them, I always ask them one thing about UTSA. I was like, what's one thing that you love about UTSA? And they say, the diversity and you know what sometimes i'm in my little office and i don't get to explore but one day after these interviews i remember taking a little a stroll down to school and i'm just looking around and i'm like wow this is crazy everyone's out here everyone's talking there's so many clubs and organizations just like conan said just be part of something you know the academic side you know what you're going to have with the academic side but there's so much beyond those doors another great advice i have uh just as a person coming to any kind of institution is don't be afraid to open any door. You are coming to our campus. You, you are our customer. You know, you, we are here at your service. So every door is open and available for you. We have so many services. Every school has these types of services. These services are there for you. Don't be scared to talk to anyone. Anyone at UTSA that a staff member, faculty, we are here to serve you. Um, so don't be scared to have any questions, any questions like that. As well as like Conan said, yes, we are family friendly as well. We try to make sure to tell families that they can come and ask us questions. There's some stuff that it's only privileged between us and the student, unless there's some other documentation. But other than that, we welcome you. We want you to be part of the UTSA community. We want you to be here with your student. We want you to experience the whole college lifestyle with your student here at UTSA. Thank you so much uh, for uh, giving us a little overview of uh, what the possibilities are. So given that, let's jump into the Q&A session and we're gonna ask everyone um, to use the chat feature and to go ahead and post your questions um, and then we'll answer. And some of you may not have had an opportunity to attend this session. This session will be recorded and be made available on the SATS website, so, or Facebook site, right? Uh, Mr. Kumar Virapin, I'm not sure if it's on the website or the Facebook site, but he will provide us that information. So given that, I'm gonna stop sharing here and let's just jump into the chat, don't feel shy. This is your opportunity to ask uh, our advisors um, and then we'll take. So we already have our first question. What need to be done to tour UTSA? How, how would you get that going? Yeah, we are open, we are available. We do have a welcome center. Um, you just have to really go online and set it up uh, because there's limitations. You can come and do a group tour online or you can do just a, a tour by yourself. Um, it's up to you. I would suggest doing a tour. One of the coolest things that we do have every single semester um, and it's coming up in February is UTSA Day. And so UTSA Day is basically a big, huge open house and 
anything and everything you need to know, want to know about UTSA is going to be there. So let's say you're interested about uh, engineering. So guess what? You can go to UTSA Day, do tours, housing tours, and go to an engineering uh, department uh, information session. Um, you can do all that within one day. It's amazing. It's on the Saturday. It's in the morning. So you don't have to take any time off of work or anything like that. And all that information is totally on our future Roadrunner website. Um, and I could drop the link in a little bit in the chat, okay? Okay, thank you. So the next question is, how would how would I help my kids to choose the college? You know, uh, Fidel, you mentioned that so many opportunities, right? And that can be overwhelming. How how can a parent help a child? Yeah, so, so I'll give, uh, Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. No, no, uh, it's just that um, some more points to that. Like, I, I really don't know, should I go by the choice that my kid is making in the area she wants to go? Or should I go by the, the so-called popularity of the college? I'm like, there are two parts. Should I go by the field or should I go by the college? So I'll tell you, from, in my opinion, what not to do. Popularity is a place where you should never land yourself. I always tell students and their families, even if it's Harvard, visit the campus, visit the department, interact with the faculty, interact with the, um, the offices and programs that support the community like student life and it's about fit. Harvard could be the best school in the world if you don't feel comfortable there, if you don't feel welcomed there, even if they're welcoming you but you don't feel like you're a part of it, it's not going to work. I have had students who've gone um, to very prestigious schools, lasted a number of weeks. I had a student that I was so happy for her when she got accepted to Baylor. She went off, she got there, she lasted a month. And then she called me and said, okay, I'm back home. I said, Why are you back home? It just didn't work for me. So before you, you know, get caught up in this idea of, oh my gosh, it's in the top 70 schools in the world. I have to go there. You need to see, does it work for me? Sometimes a school may not be in the top 10, but you see in their particular program, the instructors who are part of that program, the faculty are so immersed in the field that you know, okay, I am going to be successful because these people make up the community of the career and the profession of which I wanna be a part. So each of us has really unique reasons for choosing the school that we chose. For instance, I went to Louisville, Kentucky in the middle of the Midwest and my friends would make fun of me saying, oh, he went to Kentucky Fried Chicken, he'll be right back. And they didn't, nobody understood, why would I choose to leave a tropical island surrounded by beautiful beaches and go into the middle of the US to deal with snow every single year? It was because I felt like I fit in. I connected with an instructor there who told me, whatever you need, we will be there for you. The type of college that we are creating, it's focused on interdisciplinary learning. I started off as a business major and I ended up in education just because they would pair students together from different parts of the university, send them around the world, affect change in the communities in which they were around the world, and then come back and say, what did you learn from it? So I was in Central America and the Caribbean, learning not about just how to manage programs from the business perspective, but the impact of the management I was having over say dental students or education students in the classroom was having on the people whose lives they were changing. That's why I went to that school. So you have to think about what does this mean for my child or for me? What impact do I potentially want to have in the career that I'm selecting? And is that school going to get me there? It could very well be UTSA, but I don't want you to choose UTSA just because they won the, the championship, right, Hervé? I want you to choose them because when you went there and you saw the program that you were selecting, it made perfect sense for you. Or when you went to Texas State, um, my cousin just graduated from Texas State a year ago, making $100,000 a year as a new graduate living in Austin. And he didn't do it because he was gonna make that money. He realized he was going to flourish at Texas State. Uh, the question started off, how do I choose between a community college and a public college? Well, I'll throw the private into the mix as well because a number of us overlook private schools because we get sticker shock. We see, oh my gosh, it costs at least twice as much as a public school to go there. 
but that's just the price. It's kind of like shopping for a car and you just see the price on the window and you say, okay, I'm not buying that Lexus today because it costs $45,000. What rebates are in there? So UTSA has this program. If your family earns up to a certain amount, you can go to school for free, right? So you have to think about those things. Private schools are the same way. Why well, say it's really great to start off at community college sometimes. If you participate in the honors organizations at community college, when it's time to transfer to school, whether it's UTSA or we have St. Mary's or Trinity or Lady of the Lake, I don't wanna miss out anybody, or Incarnate Word, many of them will say, okay, because you are participating in you, these programs, you get a discounted rate. So the price you see advertised in the school's website is not what you will be paying. Or because you come from a certain community, it might be that you're a legacy, perhaps um, your parent went there or because you're going into a specific program or because you have a particular background. Sometimes they offer scholarships to students who come from India or from Barbados. And they'll say, just because you came from Barbados and you have a 3.0 GPA, we are giving you a scholarship so that you only have to pay half the tuition. And that's very important for people. Yes, the school could be a good fit, but if I can't afford to go there, I don't think I'm going to go. So there's a lot that you have to think about in making the decision, but make sure it's a decision based on what feels right for you. So at the end of the day, it's about what feels right for you. Awesome. So there is one question about a medical program. Is there a way that they could go directly into a medical program uh, after high school instead of going through undergraduate school or pre-med school? Yes, but it's not in the US, <laughs> short answer. So a number of schools, outside, and, and I, I don't like to take international schools off the table because they're very viable in terms of you having options with education. Yes, I operate in the US, but I always tell my students, the world is your playground. When you graduate, you're not just competing with students in your town or your state or even your country. There are students who are looking at jobs in San Antonio right now who are finishing up their studies in Japan or in Germany, who speak four languages and are the head of their classes. We have Toyota. Uh, we have a number of other large companies and corporations in the city. So we have to think about how do we compete against every other person who's in this degree, not just at UTSA or UT Austin, but across the world. So don't take it off the table. If you're very much inclined towards getting into a medical program immediately after graduating high school. Look at the options, broaden your options and see what's available on a global scale, but what will definitely be accepted in programs in the US. Because at some point, if you want to practice in the US, are you gonna come back and do residency in the US? And is the degree that you earn going to be accepted in the profession in the United States? That is what it really boils down to. Awesome. So this is for a Texas State and probably UTSA. Normally, when are the applications issued for 2023 admissions? And when does one hear about, hear the response from the university thereof? So I'll go first, Cohen, and then you can head on. Uh, head on. So first of all, I'll be remiss if I did not mention Cafe College in this uh, conversation. I used to work for Cafe College as well for uh, almost six years. So I have a very holistic view of higher education. So that's why I work at UTSA. But the other day, I was just working with a San Antonio College student who did not have, who wanted to do RTF at UTSA, RTS Radio, radio Television Film. We do not have anything that really relates to that program. Texas State does. I have no problem pushing them to a great program. It's you have to go where the program's at. But you know, Cafe College itself, it's a um, it's a it's a resource center for the city of San Antonio. It's free. It's basically the college and career center for the whole city. Anyone can go. It's free. You don't have to have an appointment. You walk in and you talk to a college advisor. They'll talk to you about everything, career, financial aid. And they're, they're not paid by any college or anything like that. They're just really there to help you out, help you through the process. Um, so I'll be remiss not to mention them. 
Uh, one of the things with the application, application processes usually begin August 1 for most uh, state universities. So the 2023 application won't open up to August 1. Uh, most every school is going to be a little bit different uh, and also depending when you submit your application. So the earlier you submit it, the faster you're Going to, going to receive a response. Uh, just to make sure to follow all the instructions. We're lucky nowadays that everything's on the internet. Honestly, it's a click away. It's in our search button. All you have to do is put admission requirements and it'll show you every single thing, every single um, we're trying to create less barriers for everybody, right? So it's going to be up there. And usually it's just an application on whatever uh, application website, like Apply Texas or Common App. And uh, for here, for UTSA, um, as a freshman or a transfer student, it, it takes about four to six weeks after you have a completed application for you to receive an admissions decision. Um, sometimes it might take a little bit longer, but it's for those students who have to go through a very distinct program. Like here at UTSA, you're gonna have a little bit longer if you wanna go into our architecture program, because what happens is it goes through our processing team, and then we, you know, we look, review it, and then we pass it to the architecture team. The architecture team has to look over your portfolio and your application, all the other requirements, et cetera, and then they throw it back to us. So it'll add them up two more weeks. But um, yeah, we're actively working. Uh, one of the things, if you do do transfer, it's a little bit tougher than, um, not tougher, but it takes a little bit longer than regular freshman admissions, just because we actually look at your transcript and look at every single class and make sure that every single class here at UTSA is transferable, if it's applicable to your degree, so we don't, so we don't make any mistakes and all that good stuff. So it takes a little bit longer, but you know, at the end of the day, it's a more accurate. Conan, you want to add something else? Yeah, so one of the things that Irby was talking about is how it is different for uh, every university for the most part, but I will say the freshman admissions policy for Texas State is going to be very similar. We're going to open up our applications on August 1 of 2022, and then they will stay open all the way until March 1 of 2023. So that'll be our priority deadline. So it is in the future uh, ways from now, but those dates rarely change so you're probably going to be anticipating the same dates now if you're interested in applying as a transfer student what we would need is the um, transcript as well as application and then that application will be something that opens up on august 1st of the year prior so in august 2022 if you're looking to come in for fall 23 and then it will close july 15th of 2023 so it does give you a large window of time to submit an application as a transfer student if you would like. Um, the freshman admissions process uh, for us next year might look a little bit different compared to this year. Because of the pandemic, we have been test optional. However, uh, we are still talking about how long are we going to keep that policy for. So I would just encourage your student if they are interested in coming in for the fall of 2023 to try and take an exam uh, because it might be needed for uh, not only Texas State, but other universities as well, as we move towards um, a little bit more normalcy in our lives. So I would try to take it at least once in their junior year, and then see how many times they can take it in their senior year, how many times they're comfortable with, and everything of that nature. Um, because that is going to be part of the admissions process, more than likely. Apart from that, check out for essays, letters of recommendations, or anything of that nature. For Texas State, those are all optional requirements, so you do not need to submit them for us. All we would, would all we would need will be that uh, transcript, application, and possibly test scores. If you have a student who is already looking for a university to come in for the fall of 2022, then for Texas State this year, we are not requiring test scores. Instead, all we need is the high school transcript. As long as a student is ranked top 75% of their class, we will review them holistically, looking at their GPA and see things like the number of A's, B's, and C's, as well as the rigor of their courses. Those weigh heavily whenever we look for admissions purposes. If we have students who have similar GPAs, that's when we bring in those optional requirements. So if a student has a similar GPA but has a really strong essay, or they have really strong uh, extracurricular activities, where they have extensive help with communities um, or they have work-life experience, then those are the students we lean towards 
to bring them into the Bobcat community. So it's really a matter of looking at the whole student whenever GPA doesn't tell us everything we need to know. Thank you. The next question is, can a kid with H4 or other visa can get a college admission? Can anyone take this? Uh, they're already here, but uh, they're from another country with an H4, a work visa, or a dependent or a, of a work visa, um, or any other visas. Can they apply for a college education admission? So the one visa where you cannot apply for college admission is gonna be your B visa, where you're coming in as a visitor. Then the requirements change dependent on the other visas that you might have. For some students, for instance, they might be coming on with um, a family member who has their student visa. They might be coming on as an au pair or an, another um, category where they can study part-time but not full-time. So it's really important that you speak directly with the CVIS official or the um, member of the community who is responsible for international admissions so that they can tell you at the current time what the requirements are for that given visa. And I say at the current time because given the past year and a half or two years that we've gone through, some things have been adjusted by CVIS because of the uncertainty of the pandemic. So I don't wanna to speak to what is normally the protocol and now we have some changes in the system. So most definitely speak with the specific official at the schools where you're interested because there's some processes that might be a little bit different from school to school, but overall based on visa categories, those things are dictated by the State Department. So speak directly with the school official to understand what the expectations are, because I see there's another question in there as well about a student who's finishing high school and, and they don't have a green card. Um, that's a very complex um, process that they would have to go through because some schools view students uh, who might have gone to school here without green cards in certain categories. So we would need to know under what category was the student able to complete high school and then what are the plans for the family, the student and the family moving forward to determine how they would be able to enter school if they are able to gain admission to school. So those are really specific um, questions to have answered. It's person by person. So I would direct you to the official at the school to get the answers that you may need. Okay. The next question, I'm trying to word this right. And if I'm not, please let me know. If there are two students with the same level GPA and, and what can a student do proactively to, uh, to get it higher, to get a better opportunity in higher education is what I'm thinking that question is. Oh yeah. Um, I'll start off and then I'll throw it over to my university colleagues. So the one thing that I always tell my students to do, it's, it's not just your GPA. The GPA will get you seen, but it might not get you there. What are you doing outside of the classroom? Any student can get a really good GPA, but do you have what we um, in higher education really focus on right now, marketable skills? What is the experiential learning component? You might be a great student, you can, definitely get a 4.0, but how do you work in a team? What does group work like? How do you socialize? How do you interact with other human beings? This is especially a concern in the health professions now. I don't know how many of you have complained about going to your doctor and you can say, this is the best doctor on paper, but they don't know how to talk to people. Schools look for the same attributes, just as important as your GPA would be what are your skills? What is that experience like outside of the classroom? So they want to see what volunteer opportunities and there are schools that demand this before you can even get in the door. UIW is one of them. I worked with our Saudi community for a long time and all these students would say, Mr. Fidel, can you please certify that I completed all my volunteer hours because I have to have 40 hours for UIW. So some schools are emphatic about that. Others, it, it could be the determining factor between two students. 
So it's really important. What are you doing outside of the classroom? Are you participating in sports? Are you participating in any other extracurricular activity? So it could be a cultural organization much like this, so that you're immersed in something outside of the classroom that speaks to who you are as a person and the future that you wanna carve out for yourself. So those things are critical. And I know I see Conan's head shaking and Herbe is kind of twitching as well. So let me turn it over to them. No, this is an excellent point, Fido. So it's really what you do outside of the classroom, those connections you make, those networking opportunities that will help you with letters of recommendation or even something to show experientially. So if I have a student who wants to go into the medical field um, and they have leadership qualities, being maybe a, a student leader with other peers, that student is going to be shining above others who have the same GPA. So I don't want to just repeat everything you said, but that's exactly right. Like, that's what I've seen day after day. All great points, uh, of course. Um, luckily, we have uh, a lot of great um, programs here at, uh, in Texas itself. So like uh, we have the top 10% program. So a lot of times, even if you, everyone has 100 GPA, you're still eligible to get into the four-year public institutions. But really, what's super important, I want to go beyond admissions, is you know how to pay for college. And I, I know there might be some questions over there. And it's more true about what you do beyond the classroom for that because a lot of these scholarships will ask you for you know what are your extracurriculars how many community service hours do you do you know what are the extra things you're doing um you know it's great being academically sound um but going beyond that you really have to have that on your resume uh, because you know what even though you make it to that school that you really really are interested in and you might be you know this is all about you, this is your school, your great career, the great program. You know, sometimes a lot of students, uh, they might not have the money to do that and they might have to do a different pathway, but great, you know, the, the, the most amazing part is there's a lot of different pathways to completion and we're all here to help. But yeah, for sure, just creating a, a great resume. And you know what, our schools do a great job. They do a great job of providing students opportunities to do that um, and they just have to ask. I know like I used to work in high schools for a long time and we have great clubs at high school. We have an interact club. Interact club is whole thing is about community service, you know? Um, and so just doing that um, and just always making sure if you have a high school student to have the high school student go into their career center. Uh, the career center is super important. It's open and available and almost every high school has one and uh, they're all there to help you. And, you know, even if they're middle school, school students or freshmen, they're still eligible to get into that career center and talk to those career center um, professionals. That's super important to get, uh, to get going. And you know what? I'm, I'm preaching to the choir here. You're here on a Saturday afternoon listening to us. So I know you're proactive. And I know that you know, you're going to take these words and uh, take them beyond this little session that we have here. Thank you. Okay. So we're going to take a couple of more questions uh, before we close the session today. I know many of you may have questions. So I'm going to ask if uh, Fidel, uh, Conan, and Erbe, if you can propose your contact information or a website link as to how they can ask questions post-session, uh, that would be extremely helpful. So I'm just gonna take the last couple of sessions before we close for the uh, day. So what are some tips you would offer to a student when they're writing essays, you know, as a part of the applications for the college? Uh, how can they get some tips or, uh, is, are assistance available to, to, to help these students who are writing these applications, you know? To so for UTSA, them? like, first of all, we read everything. So uh, Conan can, you know, attest to that. Well, we read everything. So if you send in an essay, we're reading it. Uh, but on that note, um, keep concise. Uh, pick something that's, you know, read the title, and you know what? A lot of these uh, essay app applications, they have prompts. So that means they already have the question lined up. Um, read the title and speak from the heart. Um, we have plenty of students who submit very generic essays like, yeah, you know, blah, blah, blah. And you know what? We, we read them all. So we, we understand. And a lot of our admissions have a rubric. And, uh, you know, we 
we're going to grade it. And the better your essay is, the higher you're going to uh, score in that rubric. So really put some effort on it. Uh, you know, just speak from the heart. And we understand when we can see when you're just being generic and just uh, doing this for a grade, because a lot of students have to do this for a grade in high school. Um, but yeah, just speak from the heart and just tell us a story that, uh, because after about a hundred of these, it's kind of boring. So just tell us a good story, right? Yeah. So the last question, um, I'm sorry, others, if I'm not able to uh, take all the questions due to our time frame, but how can we, uh, as parents, right, how can we seek what your kids are interested in and to help them and help them choose the college? Like, uh, really as a parent, what would you do? Oh, yeah. My dad did a wonderful thing. So my dad's not the most extroverted person with family. When it comes to a wider community, he won't stop talking. But when it comes to engaging with kids, it's almost as if we're dynamite. So he'll hold us at arm's length. So the way he did it was, what do you want to do with your life? And I started spouting off all these things. And to show he cared, he went and got all these books. And he's like, I found this for you. Tell me if you really like it. Or let me connect you with this person who's in this profession. That's one thing that you can do as a parent. Because I know sometimes there's that generational gap. We might like engaging with our kids, but they just don't get it. Sometimes it's lost in translation. So just sit them down and be very matter of fact with them. How can I help you? If it's, I can connect you with somebody who's in the field, or I can speak with a school that can connect you with somebody in the field, let me do that much for you. Um, I know I was resistant when my dad was trying to help me, but I listened to the people he connected me to. And at our college, we have instructors and most universities are like this, who have one foot in the classroom and another foot that's still in the field. So they stay abreast of whatever is changing as it changes. So those are the best people to understand how do I translate what I'm getting in theory to practice so that a student, what I was sharing with Usha yesterday is this is overwhelming. We are preparing students for jobs that have not been created yet. How do you do that? We talk to the people with their hands and feet on the ground, making change right now. So if you wanna be a parent who's proactive, connect your child with someone who is in the classroom, but who also understands what's really happening in the field. That's the best approach that I would say to take. Awesome. Um, again, thank you. Uh, Fidel, thank you, Arbe and Conan for really helping us uh, get a better picture of what higher education is in America. We really enjoyed this session. We enjoyed uh, what you shared with us today and very informative. And I bet I'm speaking for everyone that we learned a lot through this uh, session. So I'm gonna ask, uh, I, want, I do wanna thank Yvonne Galindo. She's behind the scenes, sort of a person, but uh, she's a star. She's helped a lot uh, to make sure uh, you know, the speakers were unmuted and, and the session, she was ready if something were to happen that she would be ready to support us. So Yvonne, thank you. And all she said was, you know, Sha, if you can cook me Indian food, I'll do it. So that's her price. Uh, so I, I have to stand by that uh, after this session. But thank you again. So Vali, the floor is yours. Thank you, Usha. Thank you, everyone. Um, uh, this was just a start for all the questions as an Indian parents we have in mind. Um, and you know what, Busha, moving forward, we might bother you with more specific questions based on the feedback that we have got. So please support us. And uh, we really need this as a community moving forward to help ourselves and help our kids and be more successful as a community here. Thank you so much. Thank you so much from the bottom of my heart. Thank you so much. And uh, Mr. Veerappan, do you have any words to share? Absolutely, Usha. Usha, thank you so much. Thank you so much for helping okay. us and bringing all those wonderful speakers. Um, thank you, Mr. Fiddle. Thank you, Conan. Thank you, Irby. Congratulations, by the way. And uh, dear parents, um, I hope you would have all got a lot of messages, a lot of information. And if you have missed anything, don't worry, we're going to upload this video, the recorded video on our YouTube channel, and you can replay it and um, hope you have all those links provided. I have all those links. I have copied those links from the chat 
I can probably consolidate and will will share those links to you. And I would like to thank the Youth Club core group members, uh, Bali, Sashi, Jenny, and uh, Manju. Soon we will be launching a web page in within our San Antonio Tamil Sangam's website with all these details. And I know Vali already has a big plan. She, she yesterday she said like she has programs lined up for all the months. Uh, so we're going to be a busy group. And uh, thank you so much, uh, parents, and thanks everyone for joining on this wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. <laughs> bye.